today we will be examining John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. Uh, arguably one of the most famous inaugural addresses ever delivered by a new president. This one happened to have been delivered on January 20th, 1961. I think I'm going to uh, read it out loud in highlighting words and then I'll come back and address those words. Well, that's my plan, but I frequently deviate from my plans. Vice President Johnson, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chief Justice, President Eisenhower, Vice President Nixon, President Truman, Reverend Clergy, fellow citizens. We observe today not a victory of party. When he says party, I hope he's talking about his political party. And I've already deviated from my plan. He's not talking about, uh, he, he's talking about political party, which in his case would have been the Democrats. And uh, this is interesting because uh, it seems like, yeah, Democrat, but a celebration of freedom, celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying, so symbolizing, uses symbolizing, symbol is um, something that stands for something. Symbolizing stands for something. Uh, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning. Signifying to signify something is kind of to show it. So to show renewal as well as change. Renewal is to make something new again. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. Solemn, it's like sacred, it's like holy. Uh, and also like just very serious. And oath is a promise. Our forebears prescribed. This is like when the doctor prescribes something, you have to do it. Prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. Forebears are those who came before us. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands. Mortal means mortal is mortality. Uh, human uh, has to, mortal kind of, yeah, kind of means like human. It's uh, immortal, would be ideas like God, but uh, human, humans are mortal. For man holds, and man, when he says man here, of course he means humans. Man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish. Abolish would be to um, uh, get rid of. abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. So that's a really powerful statement about the power that human beings have in 1961. And that's different than what humans had the power to do in 1776. When he is talking about the power, so I'm gonna highlight power because that's really what this is about. What are the, what is the power? Humans being, human beings have in 1961. It's the power to abolish all forms of human poverty, to end suffering, but also to end all life. All forms of human life, which we're talking here about the existence of nuclear weapons. So just to give you a sense of how different things were in 1961, the first, second, third paragraph. In the third paragraph of his inaugural address, John F. Kennedy mentioned nuclear weapons. And yet, the same revolutionary beliefs which our forebears, that's again, that's Thomas Jefferson, uh, George Washington, 
The same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state. When he says the state, he's talking about the government. The rights of man. So what are the rights of man? Again, humans. Come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. What he's talking about is like from the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Truths, self-evident, that there are certain rights that human beings have. And these rights do not come because the government gives them to you. These rights come because they are essential to our nature as human beings. They are self-evident. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs. The heirs are like the people who come after. The inheritors, we have inherited that first revolution. So these are reminding everyone, reminding his audience that that first revolution was fought to establish these rights for people and that, that we have inherited that. We are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe. A foe is an enemy. Foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. Born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage. How's that for a unifying statement? Our ancient heritage, it's all of ours, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. That is a very long sentence and a very powerful statement about who he believes we are as Americans and Specifically in 1961, what kind of Americans? The torch has been passed means we have inherited this revolution from 1776. A new generation of Americans, people who were born in, the, in this century, meaning born in 1900 and beyond. So if you were born in 1900 and 1961, you are 61 years old. Probably, if you were 61 years old in 1961, you were 41 years old in 1941, and there's a pretty good chance that you fought and won World War II. That's what he's talking about when he says tempered by war. To temper something is to make it stronger. So he's got a reference to World War II and to veterans of World War II. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. So he is definitely really quickly moved beyond, yeah, any discussion of the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party or anything like that. And he is going big with big ideas about America. I circled all these words here because they're all verbs. This is what's called a parallel, parallelism. Um, and the way that the sentence is set up, it's just brilliant. Let every, let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall. So it's like you can always say, we shall. Well, what are we going to do? Oh, we shall pay any price. We shall bear any burden. We shall meet any hardship. We shall support any friend. We shall oppose any foe. So that we shall basically gets distributed to all of these phrases that are separated with commas, and that's how a sentence like that works. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of a faithful friends. 
old allies. Who's he talking about? Old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share. Really, he's talking about Europeans. He's even talking about Germans. He's talking about the English. He's talking about uh, Germany. He's talking about France. At this time, can we have all remaining seniors, T through Z, to the Cyber Cafe, T through Z, and anyone that we missed? Thank you. We pledge the loyalty of a faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do, for we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. So here he's talking about foreign relations. How are we going to work with our allies? To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free. So the United States has always ha has liked to view itself as an engine of democracy or a promoter of democracy. And that's been Somewhat true sometimes and less true at other times, but it's part of the American idea is that we promote democratic ideals to other nations. And in the 1960s, late 1950s, there were a bunch of countries all over the world that, uh, that were under colonial control, and then they were able to break free of that colonial control and um, start to have their own democracy. So this is what he's referring to. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. Iron tyranny could be a reference to the USSR, and we'll find all kinds of references to the USSR because this earlier in the speech in the second paragraph when he was talking about nuclear weapons and destroying the whole world, that was really all part of what is called the Cold War. And Kennedy is one of the most Cold War of the Cold War presidents. Um, actually, Eisenhower, Kennedy... Uh, uh, LBJ, all of those presidents, all the way up till Reagan, and George H.W. Uh, Bush were all involved in the Cold War. That's a long, many, many years of U.S. history. This, the, one of the prime concerns of the U.S. president was the Cold War. And that was a war that was between the United States and the U.S.S. Are. And now it's Russia. The USSR no longer exists because the United States won the Cold War. And part of the resolution of the Cold War was the USSR uh, dissolved. And it was replaced with Russia as a country. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery. He's talking about poverty. He's talking about what would have been called third world poverty. You would now call it um, developing nations poverty. Good afternoon, New Tech here. You're announcement. Please bring a few dollars this Friday to purchase some 